I Lit Wit podcast. I'm Dr. James Kundart. And I'm Dr. Len Hua. And we'd like to make a disclaimer that this is not only our beta test of the, of the podcast, but we don't want this to be used as medical advice. So please see your eye doctor if you have any medical concerns. So we are just the two kind of uh, educational optometrists who are um, interested in different like scope of practice in optometry and uh, the idea is to mine the eye literature and then to see if any pull that we can bring into our clinic to help our patients. And our students. Yes. And, mm -hmm. uh, and everyone else who uh, might be affected by this. So let's go ahead and dive into today's topics. We're going to spend uh, just a few minutes talking about a few things that are timely, yeah. we think. And we try to do probably like one or two topics per episode in a sense, uh, just like a quick thing, something interesting. So, And Len, um, your expertise is in pharmacology. Yes, I have a little bit of knowledge in pharmacology and, and Dr. James Kunda, James is very uh, uh, knowledgeable in terms of binocular vision and a lot of other optometry uh, uh, practice field as well. And we may go into things like nutrition later on this yes, summer. So we want to talk about a few things that, that we tried today. Uh, if we have an overall topic for today, it's the uh, juncture between optometry and surgical eye care. Uh, optometry scope of practices tend to expand in the, in the more recent decades. And one uh, area in, in which uh, we've expanded is in the use of topical pharmaceuticals, including the uh, iodine-based antiseptic betadine, which is being used off-label for epidemic keratoconjunctivitis. And, and you actually, one of the earlier... Uh, kind of practitioner who apply the, the, the um, approach, right? So well, I'll tell you how that worked. I, I, a lot of us have read about this in the Melman Thomas Guide and Review of Optometry that comes out every summer about uh, the TPA update. Or maybe you've gone to one of their very popular talks at, at one of the conferences. They're very good speakers and uh, they, they know their stuff because they're in the trenches and they're practicing. But when I, back in, uh, after my residency, I uh, was over in 2000 and I was in private practice in Pennsylvania. I had heard about this technique for using topical betadine on the anesthetized cornea, and we're talking just a drop of the stuff followed by a heavy lavage um, to eliminate the virus that causes epidemic keratoconjunctivitis. And I've learned that virus is probably the adenovirus, maybe number eight or 18 mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, is, is causal. And I've also learned that, that patients that have uh, other, other assaults on the immune system in the household, like in Pennsylvania, it was mononucleosis seemed to trigger EKC Mm. Even though we think mononucleosis is caused by the Epstein Barr virus, mm -hmm. uh, it, it distracts the immune system enough that you can get this, get this infection. And, and for those that, that aren't aware, alcohol swipes don't kill it well, so you can pass it on with your Goldman tonometer chip, chip if you're not careful and you're not soaking that in peroxide. Mm -hmm. But the treatment for it, there really is no great treatment for it. You can let the patient suffer and wait it out, mm -hmm. or you can give the patient steroids, topical steroids, for a couple months. And... Uh, Neither one of those is highly satisfactory to the average practitioner. So the use of betadine was pioneered by Melton and Thomas, and I tried it in 2003. Okay, how was your experience? Well, my patient was, a, was one who was, uh, was bothered by the EKC, and I knew she had it because of, I, I didn't do the, the rapid tests available now, but I knew she had it because of the stromal infiltrates that are fairly characteristic of the disease. She uh, insisted on getting some treatment, and she wasn't happy with the options of waiting it out and getting topical steroids. So I got a bottle of betadine from the local pharmacy, and uh, it, you feel terrible breaking open the seal and using two drops of the stuff, one, mm -hmm, one in each mm -hmm. eye. But I gave her prepare cane, put the drop in, and immediately lavaged as per protocol. And uh, pretty much uh, removed the epithelium from either cornea, killing the EKC, but also making the patient rather unhappy. And I think, as I recall, I had to put her in a bandage contact lens. And uh, she wanted to get a second opinion after she had wow, that happen. Okay. I, did, I didn't encounter any lawsuit or other trouble okay. from her, but, uh, and, and the EKC was cured. But it's, it's sort okay. of like uh, having to destroy so something. So she did come back. Uh, yeah, she, she did eventually come back, and she was, she was fine. There was okay. no scarring or anything bad. But, uh, yeah, she was, uh, she was not a happy camper. Uh -huh. uh, maybe I, let, I waited uh, you know, two seconds too long to lavage. But it's strong okay. stuff. And I think in our clinics now, in order to avoid the waste of the bottle, and uh, it still uses treatment. We use a betadine swab that become, comes mm -hmm, pre-soaked, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you, you put it around uh, the margins of the of the yes. cornea mm -hmm, instead of mm -hmm. on the cornea itself. So, so that that that, that way is actually more e economical in a sense that just bought, open the bottle and use two drops. So, so your approach would be what you use propericane. 
and then yeah, maybe a couple drops of prepare cane, and okay. and that's better than using uh, something with fluorescein in it because that'll confuse you whether the beta dye made it into the eye. Okay. Also, the binoxinate used in fluorox is not as friendly uh, to the average cornea as prepare cane would be. Okay, cool. And then you would. Leave it for what? 30 seconds? 60 seconds? Yeah, wait till the eyes are numb, and after a minute or two, uh, then apply the betadine. But have your lavage eye wash ready, and you know, have your chair tipped back, have the patient with, uh, you can use the dam of paper towels technique, mm -hmm. or, if, or if you can tip them back near a sink like the hairdressers do, you can do it that way. So how long is the betadine in the eye? For a very short time, the seconds only, okay. really. Okay, because based on the amount and time, they were saying maybe like 60 seconds, but you didn't do it I didn't do it that seconds, long, and right? I, I don't right. know if this patient maybe had a compromised cornea okay. or something else, maybe a, a bad okay. uh, basement membrane, but uh, yeah, I would not recommend leaving it in that long. Okay, and then afterward, probably use some NSAID afterwards just to help. Certainly something pain. to, some okay. analgesic to relieve okay. the pain, maybe an oral, okay. right, as opposed to, you don't want to use a topical like an acular or the Voltaren on a compromised okay. cornea. Okay. Okay, that's that's uh, for beta dying. Yeah, let's switch to to the next topic. Just like something. And I guess the uh, yeah, the, this kind of brought to our minds as we were discussing this, Len, about the uh, the use of surgical privileges being discussed in the state of Kentucky right now. Yeah, it, it's hotly debated actually. From from kind of uh, taking the news just this morning, say the last Thursday, there was kind of a big meeting debate uh, between like uh, ophthalmologists who are uh, very much against the idea because uh, they were. Uh, kind of complaining because they say that may uh, OD may uh, com compromise the patient care. So so the topic is being debated and uh, it will be submitted into like the the legislature for approval by the subcommittee. And if it's approved, then um, the bill will be uh, in effect by November. But but the contested uh, debate is that MD. Uh, feel that uh, OD may not have enough uh, training to do the minor ocular surgery, uh, but then the bill is passed. So uh, in order for the practitioner in Kentucky to do this minor surgery, eye surgery procedure, including uh, YAG, uh, capsulotomy, is that they need to go to kind of a weekend, about what, 16 hours of training to the board of optometric uh, examiner. So, so the national board? Uh, will be administering the, the testing or no, no it's not the national board on uh, NBEO but it's actually another separate entity the board of optometry examiner which kind of uh, an entity try to get board certification so this this kind of bring up an idea so so in a sense if uh, the board of optometry uh, examiner is is uh, responsible for uh, getting these uh, optometrists who are interested in minor ocular surgery and laser uh, then uh, it can give some legitimacy to the board certification now. You're going to feel like, yeah, there's something, if you go board certification now, you can do a little you bit more. It's going to be like it is in Oklahoma. Uh, I don't know, because Oklahoma has been doing it for a while now without the board certification requirement or, right. or doing things. So, so things are a little bit different in Kentucky. So yeah, as you know, Kentucky would be the second state that will have that privilege in terms of, of YAG, in terms of minor ocular associate. And I think it's, it's good for the patient population because like, a lot of patients who are living in the rural area who may not be able to, to get uh, easy access to ophthalmology. So this is, uh, I think, a great advance for the patient and also a good good advance in terms of, of practice for optometrists. Yeah, I guess I, I can see the ophthalmologist's point if, uh, if perhaps they're overtrained, but, uh, you know, 16 hours versus medical school does sound like training a super tech, you know, and that's uh, that would probably be their objection to this kind of thing. But it's true, yeah, because uh, ophthalmology probably may, uh, may not understand the scope of training that we had over, over like, the four-year program would cover a lot of, of uh, intensive um, understanding in terms of surgery, minor surgery, and also even ophthalmology ophthalmologists in terms of certain procedure they need to go and have special training too they don't just like get it from well, that's classes. that's certainly the way to yeah. look at it i think it's not that these people are coming out of high school getting 16 hours of training it's that they've, they've attended seven or eight years of college and you know and, and grad school uh and perhaps it's going to be like in oregon where we have injection privileges for the uh, ocular anexia but uh, you can't get those privileges unless you've demonstrated you can do them on another person a living person uh, so the, generally when you get your injections license here, unless you're a recent graduate where you've done it, uh, you've practiced on your classmates and gotten written, signed off for, you need to do it on another doctor who's taking the course. And that's, yeah. 
you know. So it'll be interesting. We'll just wait and see. We'll wait till like um, probably by the the, the mid August, then we will see. Uh, right now, there's still some debates. He's uh, still getting feedback from from the public, and hopefully, it advance and it pass, and then it will be part of the history instead of just like hot hotly debate. Yeah, I'm so sure a lot of money is changing hands <laughs> for, for both yeah. sides. Yeah. yeah. So what's the next topic we're going to talk next time? Yeah. So uh, we we we're going to end the. Uh, the I Lit Wit podcast for uh, today. This is about the, the length of time we plan to spend on these. Next next time we'll talk about another hot topic, but maybe less less uh, uh, involved in politics. In that yes. the use the use of uh, handheld electronic devices and smartphones, and, mm -hmm. and whether they are affecting our eyes adversely, and what the uh, what the literature has to say, what the evidence has to say. And actually, you you have some some data. We just we just completed a study uh, whether we did in our Portland clinic, as a matter of fact, that, that compared. Uh, the use of the iPhone 4 to the Amazon Kindle, uh, one of them is a backlit display and one of them is not, and we look, we're looking at suppression and virgins, so we'll present okay, some cool. early insight into that cool. next time. Okay, and then the next topic probably also for the next time would be orange juice, help with cataract or not? Uh, right? we, we can talk about nutrition then too, <laughs> okay. yes, that would be great. All right, thanks, thanks for your attention. And I'm Dr. James Kundart. I'm Dr. Leighton Hua. And we'll see you next time on Eyelid Wit.